Ah, hello. So thanks, Henrik. So I'm going to continue as Donald's advertised, uh, talking about this Newman Janus stuff. Uh, it's a real great pleasure to be here speaking to you all today. So thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, as Donald said at the beginning of the talk, his talk, this is work also in collaboration with Alfredo, Alex, and Justin. Um, so the main topic I'm going to explore is a specific way in which we can profit from the Newman Janus shift that Donald was just advertising should be an insight rather than a trick. And we're going to start by looking at uh, the one thing Donald didn't show in detail was how the new Genus shift emerges from the world sheet action for the interactions rather than the background field. Okay. After we've done that, uh, we'll look at how spinners can help using the chirality properties in the action and then do some specific examples and some calculations of the impulse for different solutions in dynamics and gravity. And finally finish up by uh, introducing a new feature to the problem, which is electromagnetic duality. So uh, Donald's shown you and argued that we can write the action for root curve, effective action for root curve in this world sheet form. So we have a near boundary, uh, delta sigma n, the far boundary, which is where the Newman Janus shift is, and then geodesics in this compl complex extension in the direction of the spin vector with the coordinate lambda. And what I'm going to do is go back to what Donald had and introduce coordinates on the whole sheet, uh, complex coordinates Z, and rewrite the world sheet action. And again, this is up to order curve, order squared f squared in electrodynamics terms. So we're going to be dropping higher order terms again consistently. But doing this approximation, we've got the chiral combination of the field and dual field strength. And now what I'm going to do is, because there are no sources on the world lines, I'm going to introduce two independent uh, gauge fields. So I'm going to introduce a combination of these gauge, field, gauge fields, A and star A, independent. Then I can just rewrite the uh, world sheet action in a very natural form, take in integrate using Stokes' theorem, and now I have an integral over the boundaries, remembering that the far boundary is the one where the uh, Newman Janus shift was. So, of course, we can split up that integral, and we have the difference in the two. And now the signs conspire nicely such that the integral of this uh, chiral combination of the gauge fields over the near boundary, so the real world line, cancels with the standard electromagnetic uh, interaction term. And overall, we see that the interaction now, rather than the background field, the uh, world sheet action really has this Newman Janus shift in the world line. Now, spinners are very, very regularly used in classical physics whenever you have this kind of situation where there's a natural chiral splitting. It goes back to the work in the 60s of Penrose and many others. And in electrodynamics, the typical object is the Maxwell spinner. And the Maxwell spinner is very conveniently defined in the same way that in terms of the same chiral F that we have appearing in the world sheet action. In gravity, it's the vial spinner, which obviously didn't appear in the action. There's a natural object to use in this uh, context. And these are also the natural objects where Newman Janus shifts occur. So for Ruka, the shift very naturally occurs as a plus IA and minus IA on the Maxwell spinner. And for Kerr, it's a plus IA and minus IA, IA shift on the tail spinner and it's conjugate. Ben, can I just stop you for a second? Uh, there's there's yes. a weird echo on your voice. Um, I don't know if you, do you have two microphones turned on or something like that or no? No, I'm afraid, and I put I'm afraid, this has happened before, so I put headphones in so that you hopefully wouldn't get it. Uh, yeah, it's not terrible. I mean, that's why I didn't stop you, but uh, it's a little bit annoying. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think what it is. So I am next to a, a chimney, which is a little, <laughs> it is a bit blowy here. But yeah. I don't know if it's it, because it has yeah. been making noise. <laughs> I think if you don't know what it is, we should just keep going. Yeah, going sorry. It's, it's is not, it electronic? It's, that, it, it's like there's two versions of you. So it's like there's two microphones a bit. But, oh, um, no. But um, I, I, I have no idea. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Just, just keep <laughs> on going. We, we can hear you fine. Yeah. Yeah, just shout at me if it gets really bad. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Where were we? So we 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 want to introduce spinners, right? So we've been everything's just been vectors from the world chase. So we want spinners. Um, and the easiest way to do this, multiple ways you can have a look. Um, but to have a look at what the leading order. So again, order F equations and motions are. So we just take the form that we have doing the integration by parts and look at what the equations of motion are. They're pretty easy to see why they're going to take these forms. And we can know that both of these equations have the same structure uh, in terms of the Maxwell spinner and its conjugate on the positive and negative Newman Janus shift, uh, say. And we could also introduce a common basis for the world length quantities, the momentum and the spin vector. So using the work by Kai Hamid, Huang and Huang, we could introduce massive spinners, where we've got a little group tensor encoding which of the world line dynamical quantities we're looking at. And then we have two chiral and antichiral spinners with SU2 little group indices. And once we've got these written, it's pretty kind of clear to see that the dynamics of the problem are going to be encoded in the spinners. So the natural thing to do is rather than having one equation of motion for these two quantities, just have a unified equation of motion for the spinners themselves and build those, the momentum equation of motion or the spin equation of motion out of the little group representations for those quantities, respectively. And we note that now we've got the full chiral splitting. We have the uh, chiral spinners in terms of the positive Newman Janus shift plus IA, and then the chiral one is in terms of the shift minus IA on the conjugate Maxwell spin. Okay, so let's look at a specific example to convince you, you know, this isn't just nuts. So we're going to set A, the Newman Janus shift, to zero. Then we better get the Lorentz force out. So we're going to get the Lorentz force from spinners. So I've just substituted the equation of motion from the previous slide. And then we note that because I have a, a metric conjugate contracted, sorry, with two little group indices, I'm going to have a momentum, not a spin vector. So I can rewrite this thing in terms of vectors with the momentum and then the field strength pulling off sigma matrices. And then I have to evaluate a four sigma trace to get the Lorentz force, which at the moment seems a bit silly. That gives me the projector of a two form onto its chiral part. And I do the algebra and the Lorentz force comes out. And this same algebra, while it seems a bit much in this specific example, is going to apply in all the examples we do for the rest of the talk, so for black holes. So let's now look at something a bit more interesting and look at the scattering of root curve off root curve. So I'm thinking of a root curve probe scattering off a root curve background. So the dynamics are in the spinners. So all I have to do is calculate the spinner impulse of so the integral over the full uh, dynamic, world line dynamics, of the chiral spinner. And then I recognize that the, so considering a static background, it's, has its own independent newman jana shift with respect to the Coulomb background, which Donald showed comes out of the world sheet action. So we have two independent newman jana shifts. I combine the two together and I get this result for the impulse, where you can see the two add nicely in the exponent. And this is exactly what you find when you calculate using the three-point amplitudes as Nima, Utin, and Donald showed last year. And the spin scattering, like the amplitudes, is just as easy as doing spin static for this classical equations of motion. The other thing that's really, really nice about using the spinners rather than amplitudes is it's also super easy to do the angular impulse, the change in the spin vector. All we have to do is change the initial little group spinner that's you know, hooking together those little group indices and follow the exact same algebra. We don't have to recalculate that to lambda. That's, you know, just, that's with the spinners, not with the momentum and spin vector. And the same algebra instantly leads to the angular impulse. Which is a bit different. The ampl amplitude setup where the amplitude's formula for the observable, the angular impulse is a bit more complicated than the linear impulse for the momentum. Okay, so let's go to gravity. So uh, I'm just going to look at linearized gravity. Uh, so this is the world sheet form for her. We've got now, rather than the field strength, we have the spin connection, the chiral combination of spin connections. And so all we need to do is upgrade where we had a Maxwell spinner, upgrade it to a spinner for the connection. And the covariant meaning now for the newman jana shift, as Stonel was arguing in his talk, is provided by the fact the world sheet, you know, we can interpret this shift as being on geodesics, 
effects in the, the tangent vector that's the spin vector. But rather than just do the same calculations for Kerr, let's introduce another you know, ingredient to the recipe and turn on some magnetic charges and use uh, relations for electro electric magnetic duality. So this, of course, rotates the electric and magnetic fields, the electromagnetic background, but it translates into very nice simple maps between spinners. Excuse me. So a dion you know, is defined by you do this rotation, you turn on the magnetic charge from Coulomb, and its Maxwell spinner is very simply obtained by phase rotation. Similarly, for Einstein Maxwell, it's long been known that you can generate maps between black hole solutions using the vial spinner, and they're remarkably simple. And this actually, from an amplitude's perspective for the background, has been shown to generalize into a full web of maps. So in the vertical direction, you have the double copy uh, coming into the screen, is electromagnetic duality, and then Newman Jonas shifts shifting from the left to the right. So this work by Yutin, Yuri, and Donal, then Will and Nathan. And then also Yong Wok Kim and Myung Bo Shim this year. So that's for the background, electromagnetic duality rotating between the backgrounds. But as we argued, or Donald argued for the Newman Janus shift, if it happens for a, this rotation, happens very simply for an amplitude, it should also happen for the interactions as well. So, you know, when you rotated the field, you've also rotated the charges because they're linked by the equations of motion. So we also get a phase rotation on the amplitude. So therefore, with the spinners, we're now going to have an electric magnetic duality rotation acting for the particles that the spinners are equations are represent, representing, as well as the background that they are scattering off. So this, combined with the newman dana shift that we have coming straight out of the effective world sheet action, is going to give us spinner equations for Kurt Taubner. So we now have uh, gravitational interacting um, scattering probe particle obtained by the newman jones shift, so it's got full order spin structure, and with magnetic ch charges switched on as well as electric magnetic charges. So we can do play the same game as we played for root care. We can calculate the impulse. Uh, it's exactly the same setup. Then the calculation of the uh, change total change in the Barrel spinner along the whole real world line isn't very different. We've now just gone from a field strength to a uh, spin connection. The indices, are, you might have noticed I've dropped frame indices and gone to Lorentz indices. That's just because I'm working at leading order, so the difference between them is trivial to this order. And when you go through the algebra, this is the result that comes off. So we have two Kerr tab nuts. So a static Kerr tabnut background again, and then a probe Kerr tabnut scattering off. We have the independent uh, Newman Janus shifts in the exponential for the background and the probe, respectively, and then independent duality phase rotations. And the same kind of uh, I guess kinematic structure in terms of the rapidity as you'd find for Schwarzschild if these didn't have the newman janus shift or the phase rotations. So this result uh, previously, to our knowledge, has only been found by, from using amplitudes. So this is where we have a uh, Kerr-Tabnet background and Kerr-Tabnet probe. But it's just, again, like with root Kerr, it's just as easy with the spinner equations to do this for both of them having magnetic charges and both of them spinning. It's also, again, very, very easy to calculate the angular impulse, so the change in the spin vector, like we did for root curve, we just change x1 i day to ai day at the very start. But these calculations, if you do using geodesic, starting from the linearized curve metric, are very, very hard. Um, and this show, kind of shows how it's so simple using the spinners because the, the chirality structure encodes the uh, duality and newman janus shift in a very nice way. So that was all I was going to tell you about. So just to finish up, uh, in Donald's talk, we showed that he showed that the world G actions really correspond to a chiral splitting of the couplings of the of spin multiples. The spinner equations take this, exploit it, and turn this into a chiral splitting of the dynamics for a scattering probe particle. Uh, 
Uh, the Newman Jonas shifts, uh, electromagnetic neutrality, they're all really natural in this formalism. So it's very, very easy to exploit them and do very compact, simple calculations that give you, you know, results that you can calculate using classical methods or amplitudes. And as I've emphasized, the angular impulse changing the spin vector is just as easy as changing the calculating the change in the momentum. Um, in terms of next steps, again, Donal highlighted that all the ingredients are there apart from the order f squared terms to maybe look at constraining the classical quantum amplitude. It becomes even more natural thing to do. You now we have spinners and different, you know, unique encodings of the different helicities. But to do that, we need to know what the spinner equations are at higher orders. And there are results known for tau nut at next leading order, one loop, uh, which I think Jung Wat Kim might be talking about on Friday. Uh, so it would be very interesting to make contact with that work. But to do so, we'd need to incorporate uh, order f squared, order curvature squared terms into the spinner equations. And for that, we need to constrain the, those higher order terms, the world sheet action. Um, and some work you know, incorporating these terms has already been done by Michelle and other authors in the audience. And she might be highlighting on Wednesday. But that we look very much look forward to continuing work on in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you very Sorry much. Um, so I guess we have some time for questions because you're also perfect on time or even oh, all right. a bit early. Um, questions for Ben? I guess I don't see any ones at the moment. Let me let me ask a question while we're waiting for other people to raise their sure. hand. Uh, so I guess my question is about your last point. Um, so the f f square terms and r Riemann square terms. Uh, you think the Janis Newman shift will be able will be able to constrain such terms as well in the effective action, or or is that too much to ask? Um, um I guess. <laughs> I have no substantial evidence to say yes or no either way. I think, I mean, like you know, Donal was saying, the way we've uh, determined all these things is from a three-point amplitude. So, we, in terms of the initial, you know, data feeding in, we don't have the amplitude to determine the, those terms in the action, and then get the spinner equations. I, I suspect it's probably possible, though. Like this, you know, the shift. The Newman-Jana shift originally is done for the full curve backgrounds, not just a linearized curve or anything. So I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Yeah, maybe I can say another word about that. Um, you know, I agree with what Ben was saying. One thing we noticed that you know, if you want to make the action uh, in this world sheet form look as nice as possible, um, then that suggests that you should organize your know, we should make certain choices. Um, and it may be that, you know, uh, that's, uh, it, yeah. if you take this world sheet very seriously, you might say, oh, I don't know, maybe I don't want higher dimension operators, but you might then want to organize the action in some specific way, which from a, a world line point of view, organizes those higher dimension operators in a specific way. Um, but, but right now we don't know. Further questions? Actually, I had a question I could ask. I, I couldn't yeah. find the raise hand function. Uh, um, um, yeah, this is for, for Ben and also Donald, good to see you. Um, so um, I guess one question I had is, does anything interesting happen when you reach the extremal limit? Like, is there any kind of sign of something breaking down or something interesting? And the second question I had, which is, which is very naive is, is there an analog of this type of shift for Reister Nordstrom? Uh, so the, in terms of the extremal limit, we don't see anything at all uh, because it's you know, we're just doing perturbative dynamics. That just there's no reason at this level why you can't a all the way to infinity. Um, and for Reisner and Nordstrom, you I'm trying to remember the literature now. Sorry, yeah, you can obtain it by the shift from from Schwarzschild. Um, I can't remember the precise detail of it though. I don't know if Donal, you you remember? The, sorry. Um, 
yeah i mean i think i think you just add the two terms you know you got you know um yeah because the i mean, I mean the one charge on spin you know well fair enough you've got two two operators you have each other in the worksheet so i guess my question would be is there a way of unifying like charge and spin together into some kind of set of auxiliary world sheet dimensions well you just integrate the i mean I, I guess you got this action you just or this world sheet you integrate two operators on it one is one is maxwell and one is the spin i see interesting so there's like a world sheet ver a way of, of of uh kind of doing the charge uh dynamics yeah i, I think so yeah i mean i i honestly i have to say you know uh, this is you know, I believe I haven't actually checked that, um, but um, I see. Okay, it seems, it seems pretty natural to me. So it's just, you know, probably it works like that, but um, you know, I haven't checked it. Yeah, we've we've so far only done the mag electric magnetic stuff by turning it on for the spinners and doing the calculations. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Shaoshan. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Ben. Um, uh -oh. Very nice talk. Thanks. Um, so I was just wondering, um, for higher order, is there a scenario that would be easier? So if you consider like a poor particle around your curved background, but instead of um, just standardized order, but if you consider like high and higher order, because um, from amplitude point of view, from the heavy particle, you just need a three point function. So that might be a simpler scenario than consider the uh, Compton amplitude. Yeah, I mean, we were definitely like looking for ways to constrain these terms. And I mean, the get goal, I guess, is to get Compton as an output, as an output from this. So any, any, certainly any way which we can. Uh, you, you know, combine the world line symmetry, world sheet symmetries to constrain those higher point terms, we'd be very interested in. Um, be very, yeah, that would be a very good thing for us to look into. I think. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, do we have a question from Cindy Keeler? Hi there, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I, my question is about uh, the, how much of this extends to at least the single spin case for Meyer, Myers-Perry? Oh, I have absolutely no idea, I'm afraid. But I mean, ah, I'm no expert on 5D spinner holicity at all. But uh, I mean, Donald's previous student, Izzy, worked on, and, and with other authors in the audience, worked on you know, developing a formalism for this. So it uh, should be possible. But I, that would, to be fair, that was in the massless case. So it didn't include the little group. I mean, Donald's probably got a, <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> not really. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think obviously very interesting. I don't know what would happen. Um, um, maybe, maybe for a single spin, um, maybe something would carry over. You know, there's something very four dimensional about this, um, and you know, the structure of all of these objects at higher dimensions is quite a lot more intricate. And you know, in four dimensions, you know them. The Maxwell spinner and its anti chiral friendly couple in 2 2 signature. You know. I, I think 2 2 signature is important here. You know, I don't think I'm just a crazy person saying that 2 2 signature is a good idea, but um, I hope that. So, and then, you know, if we go to higher dimensions, it's maybe not so obvious that these things are going to be so nice, especially self duality, et cetera. So, I don't know. Um, it's interesting, but we don't have any, we haven't really looked into it. So. Okay, I would have guessed that maybe some of it continues for even dimensions, but in odd dimensions, it really does seem pretty, pretty different. There isn't a nice analog of the two-two signature, etc. Yeah, yeah. I, I say, you know, yeah, it could be. I mean, you might think that there'd be something particularly nice in six dimensions, where there is a very nice spinner history formalism, by the way. Um, but um, you know, it, it might, of course, involve uh, different kinds of uh, fields. You know, uh, self geo fields. But isn't 5D massive like 6D massless? Well, that's true. It is, yeah. yeah. Same little group. Yeah, yeah. no, it is the same little group. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Good point, Lance. Yeah. 